And we'll start with question number one from Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it offers uh, to people from island communities who want to access university medical courses. Minister Shirley Ann. Sorry. I should give you a few more minutes there. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. Presiding Officer. Um, the Scottish Government supports a number of initiatives to encourage island communities to access high demand professions such as medicine. In March this year, we also announced funding of £330,000 to deliver pre-entry courses to medicine, which remote and rurality criterion being a key component of the Aberdeen University programme's target group. The Scottish Funding Council provides additional funding to universities to help improve access to high demand professions. There is a REACH programme linked to each medical school in Scotland to assist pupils from low progression schools who wish to access medical courses. My apologies, I thought the Cabinet Secretary was about to answer them. <laughs> Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for that response? She'll recognise that recruiting and training uh, staff to island health services does present specific challenges. All the evidence does show, however, that students with an island connection are more likely to work in island areas. Still, getting to medical school is difficult and school pupils need to believe they can achieve it, otherwise they won't apply. Work experience is essential, but not easy when students may know many of the students giving rise to confidentiality issues. Travelling for work experience and interviews can cost £1,000 or more and take students out of school for two or three days at a time uh, when they need to be focused on getting the five grade A's that they need. So does the Minister accept that Ireland students are facing specific disadvantage and does she believe there are further steps that can be taken to level the playing field, ensure Ireland students have the same opportunities to access medical courses and in turn improve the likelihood of Ireland health boards being able to recruit and retain the staff they need? Um, I, I would readily uh, agree with the, the premise of Liam MacArthur's point and discussed uh, this, um, this very challenge when I was at uh, Glasgow University um, recently and the efforts that they are making to encourage those from rural, remote and island communities um, to access courses uh, such as medicine. As I mentioned in my med um, original answer, the pre-medical entry programme does specifically look at rurality and uh, remote communities. We also have a graduate entry medical programme which again ensures that um, remote and rural focus is given uh, to those people uh, going through that course. Um, and I'm um, aware of um, other collaborations which continue with um, uh, the NHS to ensure that um, important career events um, and um, other events are taking place in school uh, to ensure that those in rural, remote and island communities can access all the information and encouragement that we would expect in any of our schools. And I'm happy to, to carry on the dialogue with Liam MacArthur if he thinks there are particular aspects um, in his constituency which the government needs to look at. Kate Forbes. Thank you. Um, how does UHI's campus model aid islanders and the rural west coast, which shares characteristics with the islands, to train as healthcare professionals? Because we know that making it easier to recruit healthcare professionals from the highlands and island areas will make it easier to then bring them back. Yes. The, um, with UHI as a, a key partner, we are taking action to enhance the access to medical education and training for remote and rural areas. As I mentioned to Liam MacArthur, the graduate entry programme called Scott Gen was announced in June 2016, and that will be delivered by the medical schools in St Andrews and Dundee in collaboration with the University of Highlands and Islands. It will provide students with exposure to careers in primary care in remote and rural areas and will help deliver a more sustainable health workforce for Scotland and its local communities. With regard to nursing and midwifery, the University of Stirling will, will transfer 100 pre-registration nursing places to the UHI from the 17-18 academic year, and I look forward to visiting the campus in Inverness um, to see that work when I go up to Inverness in October. Question number two, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government when the 2014 guidance on school meals will be reviewed. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, there are currently no plans to review the 2014 Better Eating, Better Learning guidance. However, the 2008 guidance, Healthy Eating in Schools, which provides guidance on food standards in schools, will be updated following any changes coming out of the review of the nutritional requirements for food and drink in schools, Scotland Regulations 2008. 
better eating and better learning, which supports local authorities in driving forward further improvement to school food provision and food education more broadly, is unlikely to require to be updated in the light of the review of nutritional standards. Linda Fabiani. Uh, presiding officer, I welcome that news from the Cabinet Secretary. A concern I do have in my own area is that very often when, when parents make complaints about what they consider to be the nutritional standard of school meals, that government guidance is quoted back almost as if it were regulation and that the local authority was hidebound in what they were able to offer. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that it can be reiterated that it is in fact guidance and not regulation? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, um, the, we do provide guidance of the type as uh, healthy eating in schools and better eating, better, eating, better learning. And that's designed to support local authorities as they deliver catering services and food education in schools. But local authorities do have flexibility to provide um, uh, food and drink services as they deem appropriate to meet local needs and local priorities, providing they have first fulfilled their statutory obligations in this respect. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the we legislate our farmers to produce the highest quality of produce uh, in, under the highest of animal welfare protocols, ensuring that we pay the living wage and we give them custodianship of the countryside. Yeah, when it comes to producing produce for schools, we find that the Central Government Procurement Excel contract is importing foodstuffs from all over the world that can and is produced to a higher standard by our local farmers. With that in mind, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to ensuring that food that can be produced locally in Scotland makes it onto the plates of our school children for the sake of their health and in support of the rural economy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, th th this is an area where um, my colleague Richard Lockhead, when he was the Rural Affairs Secretary, uh, invested a significant amount of his time and energy to work with me in, in my former responsibilities in procurement to ensure that we had um, as much effort and as much opportunity for the farming community within Scotland to be able to access uh, procurement contracts at a general level within Scotland and obviously school food contracts uh, account for a very substantial proportion of that. So, um, in principle, I'm in agreement with Mr Whittle of the importance of ensuring that high quality agricultural produce in Scotland can find its way into the procurement contracts in the public sector and particularly into our schools. And of course, as part of the learning experience of young people, I'm also very keen that young people have an understanding of the origins and the routes by which food is produced to enable that better understanding as part of the health and well-being aspect of the curriculum that is undertaken in our schools. Question number three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it has taken to ensure that schools can fill teacher vacancies. Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so the Government has taken a number of actions to help recruit teachers. We're spending £88 million this year to make sure every school has access to the right number of teachers. We have increased student teacher intake targets for the sixth year in a row. And we are setting targets to train teachers in the subjects where they are needed most. We are also supporting innovative new routes into teaching, including work with the University of the Highlands and Islands. We also launched a new teacher recruitment campaign on the 8th of February uh, under the title Teaching Makes People. This builds on the success of last year's Inspiring Teachers campaign, which helped to drive an increase in PGDE applications to Scottish universities. Rudy Grant. Um, clearly, none of that is working because the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there is 700 current teacher vacancies and this is having a direct impact on children's education. Along with this, there's a marked increase in head teachers being asked to lead more than one school and indeed that's becoming the norm in some areas. How on earth can someone lead a school when they're, only there, when they're not there on a daily, daily basis? How far will our once excellent education service fall before the government acts because children don't get a second chance of their education? Cabinet Secretary. Let me address a number of the points that Rhoda Grant makes. First of all, I recognise that there are shortages in the availability of teachers in certain parts of the country and in certain subjects. And I've set out to Rhoda Grant a number of the steps the government is taking to try to rectify that. Indeed, in this year alone, we've increased the number of places available for teacher training by 370 in 2017-18 to, to, to begin to address those issues. And the whole... Um, process of workforce planning is a complex and difficult process and quite clearly 
we have shortages that arise out of that. Uh, I also assure uh, Rhoda Grant that I'm having, I've had discussions with the General Teaching Council for Scotland, who of course um, regulates who teaches in our schools, uh, to ensure that where there are registered teachers who are not currently active in teaching, they are being contacted to try to motivate them to become active in teaching, and also that the General Teaching Council takes an efficient approach to the consideration of registration applications from teachers who are trained to teach in other jurisdictions to assess and evaluate the contribution they can make to Scottish education if they would wish to do so. Now, the second issue that Rhoda Grant raised was about the fact that some head teachers may be operating across more than one school. And I have to say I disagree fundamentally with her about this particular point. Um, I think there are, where we have um, exceptional head teachers, with the right support models in place, I think it is perfectly possible and tangible for those head teachers to be able to deploy their skills across more than one school. For example, in the city of Glasgow, um, one head teacher of a large secondary school, St Andrews Secondary School in the east end of Glasgow, uh, Jerry Lyons, who is regarded as one of the most experienced and effective head teachers in the country, has been invited by the Director of Education in Glasgow City Council to continue to provide leadership in St Andrews, but also to provide leadership in Holyrood Secondary School, which is a slightly smaller but still very significant secondary school. And my response to that was to say that I thought it was advantageous for pupils in as many parts of our country to experience distinguished and effective leadership in education for the enhancement of their education. It has to be properly supported, I accept that. But I think the arrangements that have been put in place in that example by Glasgow City Council are arrangements which I fully support and endorse because I think they're beneficial for young people in Scotland. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what progress is being made to develop new routes into teaching? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, at my instigation, um, uh, the, there were a number of uh, routes, new, new projects identified to encourage teachers to uh, enter the teaching profession. The General Teaching Council is assessing um, 11 of those particular routes and uh, some of that assessment is now complete and we are able to recruit teachers on the basis of those new routes into teaching. It's an example of where the government has responded positively to the demand for innovative approaches um, and I welcome the input that we've had from the Colleges of Education uh, to respond to that challenge the government has set. Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. <coughs> the Cabinet Secretary acknowledges that filling teacher and vacancies takes time. Now, quite often supply teachers are used when a teacher is absent, but supply teacher numbers are falling. And in Angus, for example, the number has fallen from 430 to 331 since 2011. So what urgent action is the Scottish Government taking to deal with the falling supply teacher numbers? Well, the measures that I set out, particularly in relation to the work that the General Teaching Council can take on our behalf to contact registered teachers who are not currently active in teaching but could contribute in some way towards the supply pool is one of the most uh, significant areas where we can uh, take action in this respect. But the question that Mr Kerr raises is one of which highlights the general challenge that exists in this issue. Now just before the Easter recess I spent um, two days at the International Summit on the Teaching Profession uh, my two predecessors um, took part in that summit in New Zealand and in Canada, and I took part in it in Morrison Street in Edinburgh. So we'll, the, 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 the Chamber will understand how, how attractive Morrison Street is in comparison to Wellington, New Zealand, and Banff, Canada. Um, but one of the common themes of all the contributions of the countries that were represented at the International Summit and it was very clear from my counterpart in England, Nick Gibb, who was there, and my counterparts in Singapore and in Finland uh, and in Canada and in New Zealand in very well-regarded education systems that there is a systemic challenge about recruitment of individuals to the teaching profession, which is not just about a Scottish issue. So we have got to think inventively and creatively about how we can motivate more people to come into the teaching profession. And it's part of my general work to try to raise... The, uh, the value and the credibility and the esteem of the teaching profession because our young people need to have 
a, a good flow of individuals entering the teaching profession to deliver the education upon which they are dependent. Question number four, Richard Leonard. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update to Parliament on when it will publish a new anti-bullying strategy for schools. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Government will issue its refreshed national anti-bullying guidance when the Scottish Parliament's Equality and Human Rights Committee has concluded its investigation into bullying in schools. I'm very grateful to the committee for the offer that they made to consider further evidence on this matter. Uh, we will carefully consider their views and any further evidence gathered prior to the publication of our strategy. Richard Leonard. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Um, every good strategy needs a vision, uh, but it needs a plan of action and the allocation of appropriate resources as well. And whilst bullying is not confined to young people or even to schools alone, does the Cabinet Secretary consider that the cut by over 1,000 in classroom assistants and the cut by over 4,000 of teachers in Scotland's classrooms since his party took office will help or hinder the effective implementation of this delayed anti-bullying strategy? Cabinet Secretary. But the, 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 the first thing is to say that I, I, you know, Mr Leonard puts the word delayed into the end of his comment. And I, maybe, maybe I'm just being sensitive this afternoon, but it sounded it was added in a rather pejorative way. The government accepted, responded positively to a request from a parliamentary committee for further evidence to be taken on this issue by the committee. I could have published a strategy months ago, but the committee asked if I would delay it until such time as they took further evidence. And I thought that was the respectful thing for me to do, yeah, was to de it. delay publication and hear what the committee had to say to me. And I've given the convener of the committee, to whom I'm very grateful for the efforts that she's gone to, to engage on this subject, um, due consideration to the issues that get raised. Now, we, uh, we recognise that the necessity of appropriate resources being in place in all of our schools to support young people. Uh, Mr Leonard can be assured that at the heart of this strategy will be an absolute intolerance of bullying of any young people in our schools or in any aspect of our society or in any situation in our society. And the government will map out exactly how we intend to take that forward as a consequence of our engagement with many stakeholders and the parliamentary committee in this respect. Question number five, Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government what requirements local authorities have to provide children with the basic tools of learning at school. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, education authorities have a duty under the Education Scotland Act 1980 to provide books, writing materials, stationery, mathematical instruments, practice material and other articles which are necessary to enable pupils in their area who receive free education whether in public schools or through other arrangements by the, made by the Education Authority to take full advantage of education. Kate Forbes. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In light of it being the Council's statutory duty to provide pupils with the necessary books and materials, the Cabinet Secretary may be aware that due to decisions taken by the Independent Highland Council, Fortrose Parent Council have had to fund some basic school provisions. As it is the Council's statutory responsibility, and in light of an election tomorrow, what is the Cabinet Secretary's view on this and how education can be the top priority for the next administration. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I, I reiterate my earlier answer to Kate Forbes, uh, in, in which statute could not be clearer uh, on this, that education authorities have a duty under the Education Scotland Act to provide books, writing materials, stationary mathematical instruments, practice material and other articles which are necessary to enable uh, pupils to receive free education. Um, so that's the statutory duty. In relation to the resources that are available, um, Highland Council for 2017-18 received an increase of um, over £20 million in the resources available to it, equating to an additional 4.4% increase on its budget in 2016-17. Now, th th there will be specific um, decisions that Highland Council has to make about the allocation of its resources. But I think that backdrop indicates that a very strong settlement has been delivered to Highland Council to enable it to properly fund education. Now, across Highland, uh, there has been £3,924 million pounds of, uh, sorry, £3,924,000 in pupil equity funding, which has been uh, delivered to uh, schools and Fortrose Academy has received £30,000. And I would hope that the local authority 
working in partnership with the school, would take the necessary resourcing decisions against a very strong settlement from the government to properly fund education in the Highlands. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would refer the Cabinet Secretary to the report published by the Accounts Commission in March, the Local Government in Scotland Performance and Challenges report, which set out spend per pupil figures, which showed that since 2010, spending in secondary schools per pupil has fallen by over £150, and in primary schools it's fallen by almost £500 per pupil since 2010. That's almost 10%. What does the Cabinet Secretary uh, recognise those numbers and surely that, that reflects the overall funding levels from the Scottish Government to local government which have been cut by £1.5 billion. I think the key analysis that Mr Johnson needs to look out for is the analysis that the Accounts Commission undertook which essentially said, and I think this must have been published, um, let me just, it must be just before the turn of the year I think, where the Accounts Commission said that the funding settlement for local authorities had been largely uh, on a par with the funding settlement received by the Scottish Government. So the Scottish Government um, is, has treated very fairly local government within the resources that have been available to the Scottish Government. And of course, as I just indicated as, a, as an example to, in response to the question that Kate Forbes raised with me, that Highland Council uh, received an additional 4.4% in 2016-17, which I think in the current financial climate would be viewed as really a very strong uh, boost to local authority funding and the government is delighted to have been able to make that available to Highland Council and of course to other authorities around the country. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what action it is taking to improve literacy rates. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. So enough, so the Scottish Government is taking a wide range of action to improve literacy rates across all age groups. This includes action in the early years through the significant expansion of early learning and childcare, the relentless focus on literacy and numeracy in schools through the Scottish Attainment Challenge, supported by pupil equity funding, the expansion of programmes such as the First Minister's Reading Challenge and the Read Write Count campaign, the new literacy and English benchmarks and the introduction of national standardised assessments will support the robust assessment of young people's progress. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and I should have said at the beginning that I, um, I refer members to my register of interest as I'm still a councillor in South Lanarkshire. The Cabinet Secretary for, I know, probably for the last time I'll get to say that. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that a recent report in the Times revealed that pupils are facing a postcode lottery when it comes to accessing school library services. And official Scottish Government statistics show that a third of special school library staff have been cut since 2010. I understand the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals recently expressed concerns to the Cabinet Secretary. Given this decline in professionally staffed libraries, can the Cabinet Secretary explain how his stated aim of closing the shameful attainment gap between the richest and the poorest children in Scotland will be achieved? Cabinet Secretary. Our President Officer, this is a very emotional afternoon for us all because it's the, it's the last time that Monica Lennon will share with us the fact that she's a member of South Lanarkshire Council and I'm sure uh, there will be, that, well, I'm sure there'll be uh, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth as a consequence of that uh, auspicious moment being passed. Um, in relation to the substance of Monica Lennon's question, I, I value enormously the role of school libraries. And I was recently at the Public Petitions Committee, where the committee was hearing a petition um, of concern about the diminution of school libraries. And I committed to taking forward a national strategy for public libraries, which I think will reinforce the view I hold that school libraries are crucial to the development of um, the capability of young people. Um, a few months ago, um, the member for Murray, Richard Lockhead, invited me to visit Elgin Academy and when I went there, um, the first place the head teacher took me was to the school library. And the purpose of it became apparent to me why that was the case, because the school library had been configured and led by a very distinguished and effective librarian, had been designed in a fashion to be essentially the epicenter of the school, where many good things happened, where many con con contributions to the well-being of young people were delivered, by the engagement from, between younger pupils and older pupils in the academy. Now, I cite that example because it's one of choice that the school and the authority have obviously decided to, to, to go down that route and other authorities I know are taking a different route. And I want to come down very firmly on the side 
of the role of libraries within our schools being of significance and of value to enhance the learning of young people and to improve literacy, which is at the heart of the government's uh, efforts in closing the attainment gap in Scottish education. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And also, for the final time, I'd like to declare an interest as a councillor on Aberdeen City Council. The Scottish Government's own statistics show that in Aberdeen City, not even half of pupils reach the expected level of writing by primary seven. Isn't it about time that the Scottish Government get back to the day job, making sure our children can actually read and write properly, and admit that under this government, the implementation of CFE has resulted in children leaving primary school not properly equipped for secondary? Camera Secretary. Uh, well, in amongst the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in Aberdeen City Council, at uh, the departure of uh, Ross Thompson and his, uh, from the Council tomorrow, there will be a lot of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth going on about some other issues that have been handled by Aberdeen City Council in a spectacularly unceremonious fashion, which have been of public note in the last few days. Oh, I'm coming to, you, to the question, Mr Thompson. Uh, or Councillor Thompson, as I uh, should perhaps paraphrase for the last time. But yes, I'm coming to, to the question, uh, Mr Thompson. Uh, obviously, the Government has addressed the First Minister commented on this in her responses to Ruth Davidson today on some of the challenges that are experienced in Scottish education, and the Government is focused entirely on addressing those. But I don't think it's bluntly good enough for Mr Thompson to come here and try to absolve himself of any responsibility or contribution to the process. Because Mr. Thompson has been the Vice Convener of Education in Aberdeen City Council. If, uh, you know, statute says that our local authorities are the ones delivering education. So my question for Mr. Thompson is what's he been doing about it? What's Mr. Thompson and his long service in Aberdeen City Council done to try to improve educational performance? So maybe if Mr. Thompson had concentrated on his day job and not tried to get other day jobs, he might have made a bit more progress in the bargain. Question number seven, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. <laughs> To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what action it is taking to ensure that all pupils can participate in extracurricular activities irrespective of background or personal circumstances. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, we want all children and young people to be included fully in their learning. That means ensuring that those at risk of being marginalised in education, whether in the classroom or in the wider school experience, are as fully engaged in their learning as they can be. For example, our 2014 guidance, Planning Improvements for Disabled Pupils, Access to Education, clearly sets out that school clubs and activities, school trips and school sports as learning activities which may carry duties under the Equality Act. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his, his response? In a recent Reform Scotland report entitled After School Activities, Another Opportunity Gap, it states, and I quote, extracurricular activities are an important part of a child's development it can help them socialise outside the classroom, learn and develop new skills, exercise and generally help in the development of a well-rounded individual. They also highlight, however, and again I quote, Sports Scotland works with councils to deliver active schools activities, which Sports Scotland believes should be free of charge, however many local authorities charge. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that by charging for this type of activity, the very pupils most in need of this type of opportunity are the most likely to be excluded? thus making it more difficult to close the health inequality gap and attainment gap, and what can the Scottish Government do to ensure that access for all means exactly that? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I, I generally agree with uh, Mr Whittle's point, and I think it, and I, I agree fundamentally that uh, out-of-school activity can have a very profound impact on the uh, achievement of young people and overcome many difficulties uh, that they may face. When we get into the territory of what can the government do about it, we get into territory which I've explored before with uh, Mr Whittle and with some of his colleagues about what is the right level of direction for government about what goes on within local government. Because if I start directing local authorities must do this, must do that, I, I, I don't want to put words into the mouths of the Conservatives, but there might be some complaints that I'm interfering in local government business. So there is a sensitive balance to be struck about what um, should be the level of government direction in this respect. Uh, I certainly have no difficulty in, uh, in supporting 
the aspirations set out by Mr Whittle in his question and I would local encourage local authorities uh, working within the guidance that we already issued and have issued in 2014 uh, to, to ensure that the ambitions that Mr Whittle has set out in his question can be realised by young people in our schools. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I remind members I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. The contrast is stark. In Scotland, this SNP government is putting more money into education, investing an additional £750 million to close the attainment gap, while in England, funding per pupil is shrinking in real terms, with the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee warning of schools having to cut spending by £3 billion by 2019-20, directly affecting extracurricular opportunities, according to head teachers in England. Would the Deputy First Minister agree that if people want to protect our children's education and Scotland's schools from Tory education cuts, then they need to vote SNP tomorrow in the local government elections? A very, very brief answer to that. I, 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 well, I, I, I heartily agree with that question, uh, President Officer. Thank you. Question 8, Murder Fraser. Thank you. Uh, back in the real world, Presiding Officer, can I ask the Scottish Government for what reason there has been a 62% reduction in the target number of primary postgraduate diploma in education places? between 2017-18 and 2018-19. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no such reduction has taken place. Murray Fraser. Well, that's an interesting response from uh, the Cabinet Secretary. We do, of course, know that there are currently 274 vacant primary school teaching posts across Scotland. And we also know that uh, many councils and head teachers believe that there will be additional teachers required on top of that as a result of the new pupil equity funding potentially being spent on more teachers, especially those with a specialism in additional support needs. The uh, universities are saying that they have difficulties in relation to future planning because of a potential reduction in the number of training places. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore guarantee that not only will there be no reduction in training places available, but there will be an active increase in order to make up for the shortage in teachers that who we currently have? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the point that Mr Fraser makes uh, about the employment of, of the recruitment of teachers for postgraduate uh, diploma in education is uh, an important contribution to establishing the strength of the teaching population in Scotland. And I reiterate my answer earlier on that there has been no um, reduction of 62% in the target number of primary postgraduate uh, places between the two years quoted. Um, the government has to go through an exercise with the Teacher Workforce Planning Advisory Group which looks at a range of factors such as the teacher census, local demand, the number of teachers leaving or returning to the profession and the number of students not completing their course before making any decisions on teacher training intake targets for 2018-19. That's why the premise of Mr Fraser's question is wrong. Now, I recognise, as I've acknowledged in my answer to Rhoda Grant, the shortages that exist in the number of teachers that are available. That's why this year I increased the intake into uh, teacher training by 370 places. We will continue to look at these issues as we plan for the years ahead. I'm acutely aware that as we deploy pupil equity funding around the country, there will be uh, the possibility of more opportunities for teacher recruitment, and the government will bear that in mind as we set the target intake for postgraduate uh, diploma in education places. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that uh, the First Minister put Ruth Davidson in her place when she pointed out the fact that these leaflets show just how much uh, the Conservative Party care about education, despite the fact that they go on about it all the time. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this disregard for education uh, shows that the Conservatives, Scottish Conservatives, are probably not capable of, as they would say in Glasgow, running a minage than running a local authority. Can I urge members to be respectful to other members? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, I thought the First Minister made her point extremely well at question time today, and I reiterate the fact that the Government is focused on taking the necessary steps to improve and to strengthen the delivery of education in Scotland. That will be at the heart of our reform agenda. Question number nine, Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government what percentage of school leavers in North Ayrshire in 2016 continued in education, went on to training or entered employment? Minister Jamie Hepburn. In October 2016, 94.8% of 2015-16 senior phase school leavers in North Ayrshire were in a positive initial destination. Ruth McGuire. 
While SNP policies help young people in North Ayrshire into work, education and training and have delivered the lowest youth unemployment rate in the UK, planned Tory cuts for, will hurt young people further. Does the Minister agree with me that voting SNP in the upcoming local and general election is the only way to keep Theresa May in check and make the voice of Scotland's young people heard? Minister. Well, I, I'd, I'd recommend you stick to education advice rather than voting advice. Well, of, of course I will stick to uh, education uh, advice, uh, President Officer, because I think Ruth McGuire makes a, a very effective uh, point. I hear our opposition members groan, but they will all have seen the figures. They will know that we've made significant progress over the last five years in terms of positive destinations across all socio-economic quintiles. But the greatest progress has been amongst the 20% most uh, deprived. We see a range of uh, changes to social security provision by the uh, UK government, some of which we uh, debated uh, last week. We know that by 2021, some 50,000 families in Scotland could be affected by the uh, two-child cap uh, policy in relation to tax credits, pushing more uh, young people into poverty, directly deepening the attainment challenge we have here uh, in Scotland. Of course, we will continue to respond as uh, an administration. We have committed £750 million to an attainment fund over these uh, five years, uh, including for this uh, financial year, some £4.4 .4 million through pupil, uh, pupil equity funding for North Ayrshire. So we will do all we can, but of course, we need a, a strong and effective uh, voice in other places as well. Ian Gray. <coughs> Could the Minister confirm that... Uh, when the positive destination statistics, such as those uh, he just spoke about, are recorded, school leavers moving into a job in a zero-hour contract are counted as positive destinations. Minister. Well, uh, what I would, uh, of course, say to uh, Mr Gray is that we don't have uh, control over employment law. We uh, in uh, Scotland uh, are fortunate that we have the smallest uh, proportion of the workforce on zero-hour contracts of any uh, lower, sorry, lower than the UK. Uh, level. Clearly, anyone entering uh, uh, employment is uh, uh, ending up in a positive destination, but Mr Gray will well understand our high ambitions for fair work uh, here in Scotland. We've published our labour market strategy and uh, the jobs we want to see in the uh, future will be well remunerated and will, of course, uh, contribute to uh, that fair work uh, challenge. And uh, I look forward to Mr Gray signing up to uh, that progress. Jamie Green. Uh, for those leaving school who choose not to go into further education, there must be other opportunities available to them. But in North Ayrshire, unemployment is significant, significantly higher than the rest of the UK, recent figures putting it at 11.6%. So what confidence can the young people of North Ayrshire have in this government that after 10 years that the SNP is really taking the issue of unemployment seriously? Minister. Well, they can have a lot more confidence in us in the administration than the UK government, who, of course, in uh, uh, devolving the employment programme, which will support many people into uh, work, uh, cut the funding uh, that available to the Scottish government by some 87%, resulting in us in the administration having to leverage in some additional £20 million. So we're doing a lot more to support young people in North Ayrshire and elsewhere than the UK government is. Thank you very much. That concludes portfolio questions. The next item of business is consideration of three business motions. Motion 5428, setting out the business programme, and motions 5429 and 5430, setting out stage two timetables for two bills. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against any of the motions to press their request to speak buttons now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to, on behalf of the Bureau to move the motions on block. Formally moved on block. Thank you. And no member has asked to speak against the motions. I therefore propose to ask a single question on these motions. If any member objects to that, please say so now. No member has objected. Therefore, the question is that motions 5428, 5429 and 5430 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I therefore close this meeting of Parliament.